Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews live special UCP leadership debate recap where we bring in some guests from across Alberta to talk about the biggest issues that have just gone on. And in this case, it is the UCP second and last official UCP leadership debate. Joining us tonight are two friends of the show and first time guests for both of them, Chris Moen and Rob Ward. Chris and Rob, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and pleasure and I look forward to discussing this over over the next hour with both of you. All right, great to be here, Chris. Thank you for having me on. So for those who might be listening to this later on when we drop the audio version, Chris was the first one who talked there. So Chris, can I just get you to say hi just for everyone to know who you are? Oh, hi, it's uh, Chris <laughs> Moen coming to you from uh, Northwest Calgary. And Rob Ward, do the same. Uh, Rob Ward here from Willow Park and uh, <laughs> excited to talk about this debate and Excited to see the results of this whole leadership debate coming up very soon. Yes, yes, yes. So we have uh, some big things that we will need to get through throughout the next hour. But I want to start with this question. I'm going to pose it right to Chris first because we'll do a little bit of roundtable. But Chris, how did you feel that tonight's debate went compared to the first debate in Medicine Hat? Well, first of all, my internet was absolutely clear this time. So the debate came through on my 65-inch uh, 4K TV. I only had uh, one little minor interruption on there. So uh, a big benefit for the, for the party that way that they were able to handle the workload. And uh, overall, I thought the debate went, uh, went fairly well. You know, it was a little bit on the sleepy side, but that's more or less what the party wants. They don't want a whole bunch of... Uh, whole bunch of scandals nobody wants to you know i always remember back to 1984 you had an option sir uh from brian mulrooney versus john turner and i think every ever since every time since then every debate gets compared to that one and every debate comes up short and there's communications officers and campaign managers that are sitting down having a beer say thank you we didn't have a john turner moment <laughs> That is so true, so true. Uh, this is a kind of a unique perspective that we're going to be bringing you over the next hour because, as Chris just mentioned, he was watching the debate while Rob was actually listening to the debate. So we have it from two different perspectives of who won it uh, visually and who won it uh, uh, with the audio version. But, Rob, what did you think of this debate uh, that just transpired over the last two hours? Well, I think at this point, I mean, we're, what are we, just a few weeks out from the vote or about a month and a little over a month. In my opinion, I think a lot of people have already made up their minds for who they're voting for. So this debate to me was an opportunity for people to change minds and to, you know, really put themselves out there. And, you know, we know who the front runners are at this point, I would say, with uh, Danielle and Travis and Brian. So it was, I was really interested to see what the people that were perhaps lower down on the polling numbers, how they would make themselves sort of stand out and, you know, hopefully steal a chunk of that vote. So that's what I was sort of looking for tonight. And I think there was a few moments where, you know, the people that were polling lower stood out and maybe made people think, hey, you know what, I kind of like what they said. But that that's what I was looking for tonight. And did it hit for those that were not pulling the top a little bit? I think there was some opportunity that wasn't taken, but it was interesting. Um, yeah, that's what I thought. Not not a terrible debate. Was it super exciting? No, but it was interesting for sure. No, and I completely agree with that. But before we get into the debate, I want to pose this question to both of you and anyone can take it here. Uh at the beginning of the debate, the president of the UCP announced that uh, 121,000, if I'm not mistaken, I don't have the exact number because she said it really quickly, uh, memberships had sold during the membership sales portion of the UCP leadership debate. This is uh, a bit, a little bit lower than the Conservative Party of Canada uh, membership sales in Alberta. Does that tell you something about more interest in federal politics than provincial politics? Or am I just the, the host of the show and the guy who ran as the liberal and everyone knows that I ran as liberal, just thinking way too much into this uh, concept. Rob, if you want to take that first, then we'll go to Chris. 
Yeah, I mean, even, you know, this is a bit of a bias, <laughs> I suppose, but, you know, I think most people out there know I ran during the municipal election and during the municipal election, we had a federal election. And I can tell you, and I'm sure any other candidate can tell you, it was hard to get people interested in the municipal election. I think that people are very focused on the the big one, right? So uh, what happens is to Canada as a country as a whole, especially when it comes to things like, you know, our COVID policy and our travel restrictions and our economy and inflation, those are much larger issues in terms of federal politics than they are for provincial politics. So I think it's hard to get people interested in, you know, especially municipal politics, but even provincial politics as well. I, I think federal sort of steals the spotlight. So, yeah, I, it, that doesn't surprise me, I don't think. Um, I, I think it's a decent number. I, th I think people are interested in seeing change in the province. So, yeah, I, I don't think you would ever eclipse the federal number, but I think it's a respectable number. I think people are interested in seeing some change in the province. Chris, what about yourself? Uh, Rob just hit it on the nail, and I was going to mention that a little bit later, but provincial politics, municipal politics, they don't get the big claim to fames that uh, federal politics do, because everyone seems to always care about federal politics. Uh, is this just that? Is this just uh, federal politics and the leader of the op official opposition is kind of a more important position than who the premier of Alberta is right now? Well, I think... In terms of like, definitely it's the it's the federal versus provincial. Now, when I'm at the doors canvassing, uh, what I tend to canvass the same polls provincially and federally. Um, so what I hear a lot of is um, people who are in the public service, so like the teachers, nurses, doctors. They, if they're conservative, they either won't vote provincially or they'll vote NDP or Liberal or Alberta Party. They won't vote provincially conservative because that could cost them their job. Yeah. But you come back, you know, and I did this in 2019 and, and even in 2021, I come up, I show up to the same doors. They say, oh, what are you doing here, Chris? Uh, <laughs> we told you we're not conservative. I say, oh, no, I'm with the federal guys. That time. I'm like, oh, great. Put a four by four sign on the corner lot and uh, you got two votes for us. Um, there is also the timing issue. Um, the, you know, the federal conservatives really hit that pure time frame where coming out of COVID, nobody's liking the federal government. They're they're they're, they're screwing up on the release, you know, with the passports and the and and the airports and just sort of general government services, um, and and the COVID response, and so they're ready to part with their. 10, 15 bucks for a membership. Uh, what you also had was a phenomenal campaign online with Pierre Polyev coming out with those videos weekly, just pounding away. And he had volunteers, I was one of them, who were out there selling the former membership list, going, reaching out to our friends saying, sign up here, sign up here. And so, I mean, nationally, he got, you know, the 311,958 uh, votes, you know, the number of which has been drilled into my mind with all these video conference calls with, uh, you know, with Jenny Byrne. And that really brought people together. You know, back in April at Spruce Meadows, you were there, Chris, they got 7,000 people. You know, you couldn't do that in the middle of summer. You know, what I'm hearing from, uh, from a number of my conservatives on the provincial side is, oh, I just, you know, I just want to have my summer vacation out with the family. I'll think about politics come September. What I think is going to happen is about three weeks, I think you're going to have thousands of people in Calgary who are going to then, okay, now time to get engaged. Oh, I didn't get my membership. Um, from my understandings from the party is, is that the cutoff on October or, or August 12th, the cutoff was purely they wanted to have the usual fall session start on time. So then you start walking back from there and then they needed the voting to be outside the federal voting time. So that's why as Cynthia Moore said, uh, said tonight, you know, the ballots get released on Friday and effectively Friday is the cutoff for having your ballot in Ottawa on the federal side. So the federal government, uh, I, or, or sorry, the you know the federal party, they're going to be announcing. I think it's like September sixth or September tenth, somewhere around there. The tenth, yeah. And that's when the provincial, yeah, the tenth, and that's when the provincial side is just going to be getting going with their own balloting uh, for mail-in ballots. 
So I think that's where a lot of it was. Actually, to be honest with you, 123,121 that we got, um, those ballots that far exceeded what I expected to get out of this race. And just for, I, my, just, my, just for my, clarification here, Chris, I just want to make sure I put this note yes. in here because it while 120,000 memberships have been sold, 61 of the, those thousand were part of the UCP leadership review for Jason Kenney earlier this year. So hypothetically, Correct, yes. yes, they might have renewed their membership. They would have added memberships. But 60,000 between when Jason Kenney resigned and August 12th mm -hmm. were sold in the province of Alberta. Yes. Yeah. So that's what they were sold by the candidates themselves. Yeah. Um, now, we saw the numbers, the breakdown of where the more memberships came in, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about between seven o'clock or six o'clock and eight o'clock and the UCP leadership yeah. debate. Now, we've all agreed in some sense, and I don't want to put any words in anyone's mouths here, but we all agree in to some extent that this debate was a snooze fest in epic proportion. And I say that with respect because so, there were some fist fights at the end of it, but overall mm -hmm. it was cordial. There wasn't really anyone making any waves uh, like Rajan Sani did at the at the first debate in Medicine Hat, where she went in after Danielle Smith hard. Did that do a disservice to the UCP membership? Because you look at it, and if I was falling asleep and I was a ardent UCP, I'm a political observer, I should say, if I'm falling asleep, the membership is probably going, what the hell is this all about? Chris, do you want to take this? Sure, yeah. So actually, to, to go back to our previous question on, on the actual number of memberships cast, if you signed up through, you know, if you signed up to support Danielle Smith, if you signed up to support Rebecca Schultz, Travis Davis, Todd Lowen, we let it here, Rajan Sawney, Brian G. If you signed up for them, you're going to vote for them on the first ballot. It's very difficult to say, yeah, I gave, you know, Rebecca Schultz my money. I'm going to vote for somebody else. So you're looking and and I would say that even uh, down ballot support, your second or third, if I know your first, I could probably guess who your second, third choices will be because they're in they're basically in two silos. You know, the top of which is Danielle Smith on one silo silo the second of which is uh travis taves on the second silo no um, understandable but going back to the debate yeah. though did this do a disservice so, yeah. so, to, hey, the, going back to, the, to, to the to the the members who were watching looking for that one two knockout punch because it is a close race yeah. i think there's a lot of people saying this is a close race mm -hmm. right now did it do a disservice when the only really big fireworks came at about an hour and 45 minutes into the debate between smith and taves um, it, what it would really help out with is the down ballot and deciding, okay, will Brian Jean people go to Danielle Smith or will they go to Travis Taves? Because if everybody's attacking Danielle Smith, does that mean that she stalls out or does that mean that she gets 48% first ballot and then, you know, she doesn't need anybody's down ballot support? Um, so I think that's where it was. Um, what it would also be is if you were some, if you is if you were supporting somebody like a Rajan, who would be your second? It's now more likely to be Leela than it would be the others because Rajan and Leela were definitely bouncing off back and forth. One of the other things that I think you know astute people watching are going to look for to say, okay, who are they complimenting? <laughs> you know, Leela and Rajan. It was like a love fest. They might as well have just had a big old hug uh halfway through when they were debating one another and even you know rajan goes after travis a little bit okay but now you've also got i think it was brian jean who is also like oh yeah everybody's welcome in my cabinet um the one sort of shocker and he never took the question was travis taves deciding whether or not he's going to stick around um it took if his third response had been his first response it would have been okay but it took a while for him, and that was a and that was a mistake on Travis's part, hundred percent. He should have seen it coming. It was in the social medias. It was after the last debate on the uh, I, I believe the you know the dark horse debate, the Alberta Prosperity Project. That's where somebody asked him as part of a of a uh, rapid fire question, and he and he flubbed it. Um, so he should have seen it coming, and he should have been prepared for it. 
I want to I want to get Rob in here for a second because I want to ask this question because this was making a lot of rounds during social media because I know you were listening audio so you probably didn't see what was happening on Twitter because you know Twitter is always correct and everything that goes on in Twitter is exactly <laughs> what happens anyone who listens to the show knows I always tell people to get off social media and actually have a conversation with somebody but here we are but Rob the one thing that I saw over and over again on Twitter was the fact that these candidates played defensive this uh, this uh, debate, they didn't let Smith talk as much as she did yeah. in the first debate. And Smith looked very, and this is from my perspective, because every time that they would, show her she looked upset that she only got 45 seconds to respond to a question did this did this was this a, a strategic move on the part of the down ballots to say we're not giving you the airtime anymore you already have enough we're gonna actually have a debate with just the rest of us yeah well 100 it was a strategy move because i mean when you look back at the medicine hat debate i think the biggest mistake during that debate was that they gave danielle smith the floor she had all the airtime. She talked. And if there's one thing that Danielle Smith is good at, it's talking. She did it for a living. She's very, very good at it. Now, you might not agree with what she says, but when it comes to having a discussion with somebody, having a debate with somebody, she typically puts on a master class. She's very good at it. So I think the other candidates kind of learned from their mistake from the last debate of okay, let's not debate with Danielle all the time because we saw the results of the polls after that debate. Danielle's doing pretty well. So let's let's try to take some attention off of her. And maybe, you know, like I said in, in the intro there, there's candidates that are down in the polls that need to make themselves relevant, to make themselves heard so that people know what they stand for, what they're about. And so yeah, 100% it was a strategy move. Danielle, they needed to take the focus off of Danielle if they wanted to have a hope to leapfrog her in the did polls they? here did they though rob because I, i'm going to be completely blunt here doing this this late of the game this doing this on august September, august 30th when memberships have already sold is it too late in the game to actually say okay we're we're gonna actually not pay attention to the front runner anymore because you know memberships have uh, uh, like closed and we can't sell anymore so let's just talk about ourselves with ourselves and exclude the front runner yeah, I mean, in in my opinion, I think it's it is too late. I think that was a seriously fatal flaw in the medicine hat debate. Was everybody wanted to debate Danielle, and like I'm sorry if I was in that debate, that's the last person I would have called on because she is a perceived front runner and she's a very good talker. I would have gone after who I thought was in second place so that I could, you know, if it was me, I would have gone after Travis on every single question, but. Uh, and, and they learned. Did they, they learn they too did. late? Yep. <laughs> they they certainly did learn too late. But Chris, on that point, yeah. but also on this point, because it seemed like, according to, like as Rob said, those down ballot candidates who are not in that that top tier of the Gene, the Smith, the Taves, went after Taves more in this debate than I've seen anyone actually go after a potential front runner. Todd Lowen, he went after uh, Taves in the Medicine Hat debate, but he took it to him this time, did he not? Uh, he took it to him, but still in this whole debate, is it's very much a Todd who, from the Calgary perspective. Like, Todd Lowen, he's got his loyal following with, this, with, you know, with the party faithful. And, the, you know, people like me who go to who go to conventions, know all the MLAs, you know, put up a, put up a photo of an MLA. They'll be able to tell you their name, their wife's name and their, and their constituency, you know, maybe even we call that nerds kids, in this, in this show, uh, yeah, Chris, exactly. we call that nerds. Yeah. I do that with federal politicians. Okay. We yep. call that nerds. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and other people, you know, like, like things that I know about Todd Lowen, uh, he got kicked out of caucus. He makes really great uh, pancakes or for the, for, for all the MLAs on those overnighters that they are the all nighters that they pull, and he's in the leadership debate. Um, but from his introductions, like I was always wondering, okay, he never answered the question until the very end why he's in the debate, you know, why he's in this leadership race. And yes, he went after Travis Taves, but Travis Taves actually answered the question. Oh, the difference between 56 billion and 62 billion is all COVID. And by the way, I had that split out. 
and you were in that meeting, Todd, you knew exactly where that where that number goes. So it kind of fell flat in terms of Todd Lowen's um, saying, oh, well, but, you know, the, the budget is still larger. And I still think that's one of the things, you know, the Todd Lowen, both Todd and, you know, the two independent conservatives, uh, Todd and Drew, they need to figure out whether or not they're wanting to get back in or whether or not they want to continue to attack the government. I, I think, I think Todd, Todd wants back in. Well. Todd wants yeah, back in. It Todd seems like he wants back in. Everyone, like Brian right. Jean said, let's all get him back in at the end of the debate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or at the in the middle of the debate. It's just, I, I still don't understand why he's not. He's literally running for the leadership of the party, and he's sitting yeah. as an independent, but I'm not the president or Jason Kenney or anyone <laughs> like that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, can, we, can we take a moment and... I, I have to ask this question because I, I felt stupid watching it, but what was with Travis Taves questioning Leela here about arts and culture? Was that a throwaway from Travis oh. Taves? Like to me, wouldn't the opportune time to go after Danielle Smith, because if you're the second place person right now, you need to go after Danielle Smith as much as possible. I know I just said you don't give her space, but when you have the opportunity mm -hmm. Leela here is not your main challenger. It is Danielle Smith. Or is Travis Tave saying, okay, we, again, can't let anyone have any actual airtime here. Rob, Chris, anyone wants to take this? Because I was confused at that. Rob, go for it. Because I was confused as heck about that whole scenario. Because I watched it and I was like, okay, there's some sparks flying, but there's not much going on that I'm learning about either one of the candidates. If I'm Danielle Smith, I'm hoping that Travis Taves asks me about that because it's the easiest answer in the world. Uh, Taves in his intro said the best, uh, the best way to judge a person's future behavior is to look at their past behavior. And if I'm Danielle Smith, I'm throwing that right back in his face. And I'm going to say, you know, oh, you support the arts and theater. And well, I would argue that shutting down theaters and shutting down museums and all this for you know however many months or a year or whatever it was that wasn't very supportive of the arts i would have never done that you crippled theaters you crippled museums so i'm not so sure your support of the arts is as genuine as you say it is so that's what i i mean danielle i'm sure she was sitting there just rubbing her hands together like yeah please ask me so <laughs> <laughs> and Lo Lowen I, did go after him about the churches as well, because I saw that was a little bit because and Smith as well. But it seemed like the arts and culture uh, uh, for transparency's sake, I should just put this out there right now. My husband is the former minister of culture and tourism in the province of Alberta, Ricardo Miranda. And I tweeted when that question came up and I said, how long until they actually attack my husband? Which I was surprised they didn't because they attacked everyone else and other former cabinet ministers, but not my husband. I'm not saying much, but I was kind of a little peeved at that moment. But Chris, on the note of uh, arts and culture, was... <laughs> This question is not a question that's on a lot of people's minds right now. And I, I say that with respect to the yeah, uh, the arts and culture community because I, I know them. My husband was the former minister of culture and tourism, so we have good friends in the community. But the average person is caring about inflation, gas prices, and work. Like, for me, yeah. as a moderator, I'm saying I'm not asking a question about arts and culture, am I? So this is – so I think what – what happened was, is they came up, you know, in sort of column number one, they came up with what the list of questions were going to be. And then they drew hats for who was going to be asked the questions in what order. And Travis Taves get the bad bounce of the puck and he picks arts and culture. So what does Travis Taves know about arts and culture? Probably not a whole lot. And, but what he does know is the budget. So what he chose to go after with on Leela here was the time when she was the Minister of Culture, Multiculturalism, and the Status of Women. That was her department. And what he was going after was the fact that she would come up with all of these proposals and business cases and talk about everything except about how much money, how much the future, you know, if we give you a hundred million now, do we get the money back or are we just blowing high dough? And if we're just blowing high dough, then all of a sudden, that's where the business case doesn't make. So that's what he was going after. However, 
downside to Travis taste, it was entirely inside baseball. Unless you were a conservative right around 2019, 2020, when they pulled all those arts and arts and culture tax credits that were subsequently brought back, not by Leela here. They were actually brought back by um, Doug Schweitzer Ord. under. Oh, yeah. Well, no, it was Ron Orr. But it was Doug Schweitzer who brought back all of those investor tax credits as jobs, economy, um, Tourism, innovation. Yeah. And tourism, yeah. Well, it was a tourist thing, but it was, yeah, it was like jobs, anyway. economy, and something or other. But anyways, yeah. So that's Again, where the he nerds and us with, are debating again, over yeah. the the title of a cabinet minister. The title of a Chris, cabinet this is minister, why we right. bring you on this show from now on, because you will keep me <laughs> sincere about what the name of the cabinet minister was. Anyway, go ahead. Exactly. So yeah. So I mean, so that's that's where the exchange was going back and forth. Was Leela here was saying, "Hey, I brought all of this stuff back for the you know for my friends in the arts and culture business," and Travis Day saying, "Yeah, but your first proposal kind of sucked." Okay. And there's 20 people in outside of Edmonton who know that. And there's 20 people um, outside of uh, Edmonton who are thinking. I'm going to vote on that issue who, exactly. who are a card carrying member, right? Like, again, I'm not trying to discredit arts and culture here, but if mm. I'm sitting and watching a debate, because uh, Chris and you and I have uh, disagreed on this a few times that I think debates are important, but also I think they're for mostly for people who actually, yes. who, who are card carrying members and they don't really give two craps because they're already hardened supporters for candidate A or B. Right. But I think there's at least one or two people who are watching that debate who are not decided on who their candidate is yet. Mm -hmm. And I say yet by that like small, insignificant 0.1% of the 121,000 memberships that have sold think, okay, I'm not sure. I've got my last two. They're not sitting there going, well, Travis Taves really hit it out of that park on that arts and culture mm -hmm. question. So I'm very happy that he yeah. answered it that way because now I'm going to vote for him. Anyway, <laughs> we could yeah. actually to, go ahead. Actually, to go back on that, I think it's actually, you know, the party when they're on this column, which is the column of let's figure out the seven questions that we're going to ask these people. What were you doing bringing up arts and culture? Yeah. Yeah, it, it just seemed like a really irrelevant question for the concerns of members right now. Mm -hmm. it, that was a strange one. It, it certainly was. But let's talk about one that wasn't strange, and that's education. Now, I, I, I think it was Sonny who got this question, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, yes. I, I feel like Chris is going through his about 30,000 notes he probably <laughs> took, took during this. But Sonny got the question, and it, you were right, because you mentioned this a little bit earlier. It seemed like the Sonny Ahir campaigns are trying to get each other's votes right now because they mm -hmm. there was not a lot of light between the two of them. I'm going to throw it over to Rob first and then I'll throw it up to Chris. But Rob, what did you think about this uh, this this curriculum debate that they did but didn't really have on the stage? I think what you just said is very accurate, though, that they didn't really have. Yeah. I mean, I... That's the part I think of the debate where most people started to fall asleep. It was just kind of going around in circles and nothing was really being said of substance. Um, I Honestly, I think Brian Jean said probably the most interesting thing about it, where he said, like, you know, he's about autonomy and choice. And he said, you know, we need to have choices for for parents and the people that are in charge. I think maybe it's Travis who said it. The people that are most in charge or most interested in their child's education is their parents themselves. Yeah. So it was, yeah, and there was just, school choice was brought up a few times. Yeah. The right to choose. And Travis talked about the, uh, get the transportation to uh, private schools compared mm -hmm. to public schools. Um, now we're from Calgary. We we don't have a lot of charter schools in this city right now. There are a lot of public schools, but there are a few. But in rural communities, charter schools are kind of big. Private schools are kind of big. Is this playing to the rural base in some sense, Chris? Yeah, so it's playing to the rural base. But also, and I noticed this throughout my uh, policy plenary debates at every AGM. If you want to get your motion passed, find some way of mentioning the phrase choice in education. And the phrase that Travis used 
that one's picked up. I've used that at debates and you win the day by 85%. Um, so that's where he was going with it. So that's why when I was looking at that, uh, I had to step out for a little bit on that portion of the debate. When I came back, yeah, it was uh, it was either Leela here got the original question or Rajan got the question. But I think it was Leela, and then Rajan was in was in um, was in response to it because Leela said, "Sure, I'll give it to Rajan to to, uh, to to debate on." And like I mean, Leela's biggest thing was, "Well, let's scrap curriculum implementation." Rajan said, oh, yeah, sure, I agree with you, but then I want to bring in post-secondary. And she kept on trying to pivot to post-secondary. And then the other side kept trying to pivot to, to the curriculum, and none of which will get you a single vote in the Conservative Well, it might get you one vote in the Conservative Party, because I do know that there are at least two um, there are at least two members who are actual teachers and will vote on, on the curriculum. But, you know, the biggest... Uh, one of the biggest surprises was suddenly Travis Taves gets in there and he brings up choice in education and he feeds that line about parents being the primary educators of their children and the place explodes and Jeff Davison whipping around the corner trying to be, okay guys, settle down, settle down, settle down. He's running like the whip guy uh, in, on, on the government side saying, settle down people, settle down. Um, and then they all come back onto it. What was interesting was Rebecca Schultz was not supposed to mention that. And then as soon as Travis Taves got in there, then Rebecca comes in. She mentions parental choice as well, too. She, uh, you know, uh, and then starts to say, well, this is class size and complex needs need to be addressed. Now, Rebecca's got a number of policy points, like she wants to bring in more more educational assistance uh, and uh, more teachers. She also wants to pause only the social studies curriculum. She brought in none of those. I think she was getting worried about using up the number of her uh, of her rebuttal rights. Yeah. And so that's why she didn't jump into there. Uh, Todd Lowen, again, he mentions uh, choice in education. And he gets a little bit, uh, you know, he got a decent amount of claps for it, you know. And then cue Jeff Davidson going back saying, oh, settle down. And then Travis Taves comes in and just pounds it down with the, with the, uh, with the crowd that's there, which is kind of interesting because Edmonton, as you know, from the, from the membership sales, they have the least amount of UCP support by a country mile. And so what I think is, so I was actually kind of surprised that there would be that many supporters. What I think that's telling me is they must have bust in like it was an Oilers game. Uh, from all over northern Alberta and central Alberta. You know, everybody from Red Deer North, I'm sure uh, Highway 2 is just packed going south now um, so, with a couple hundred cars from... So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose this question because I tried to watch all the debate, but again, I was kind of falling asleep halfway through it because mm -hmm. it wasn't that interesting to me. There was no, like you said at the beginning of this, there was no, you had an option, sir. If you don't show up to work, you get fired, Mr. Ignatiev. There was no yeah. knockout punch for me. Um, so I, I, I say this with all sincerity. I don't remember what question was asked to Danielle Smith. Does anyone remember this? Because... Exactly. See, the fact that you have to look wow. at it makes you think, <laughs> yes. what the heck was wrong with this debate? So I know, Chris, you took yeah. extensive uh, notes. So, Chris, what was asked of Danielle Smith in the original question? So Danielle Smith got the question. It was question number seven. So she was last. And it was on energy in the future economy. And so Ottawa that does not believe in LNG to Europe, that Europe is being viable. So, okay. That was the question that Danielle Smith got. And then she brought up the German Chancellor's trip got canceled by yeah. Ottawa. Yeah, now that you've said Stephen it, Jabot it's all coming is back. An is anti-Alberta. What we really need to do is bring in the sovereignty debate. I think you missed it as well, too, because Danielle Smith was on the sovereignty and that was it. Well, and I think that's what I wanted to bring up here, because Danielle yeah. Smith had one talking point this entire debate. And Chris, we'll start yes. with you on this. Uh, not Chris, sorry. Uh, Rob, we'll start with you on this. Why? I know if you have one thing and you're good at it, whether it be gatekeepers with Pierre Polyev, whether it be Sovereignty Act with Danielle Smith, whether it be whatever Justin Trudeau has right now, I can't even really tell you besides uh, childcare. Mm -hmm. 
was it a smart move on her to just keep on pivoting back to sovereignty? Because if I was a drinking man, which anyone knows me, I'm two years sober. They know that if you took a drink every time that she mentioned sovereignty, you would be drunk in the first 20, probably 30 minutes of this debate. Was it smart for her to continuously go back to that? Because is that what the base of the party supports and likes? I think if you did that drinking game, you wouldn't be on this show right now. You'd be on the floor. But <laughs> I mean, I could do it drunk. What are you talking about? Act thing... <laughs> the sovereignty act thing is hitting. Obviously, I mean, she's the perceived front runner. Uh, all the polls show her in the lead, and you know, I it's working, and the opponents know that. I mean, at one point, what was yeah? This was the most interesting part to me about the sovereignty act is. Danielle Smith kind of went out of her way to say the Sovereignty Act is not about separation. She stated that, and immediately after she said that, uh, Leela here said that it is about leaving Canada. And I'm like, well, hold on. She just said that it isn't. So, like, I thought that was kind of a, like, you know, I, I think that was a scripted shot that Leela was trying to take, but it just did not hit at all. Um, and I, th I thought a shot that... Uh, you know, Tra uh, Lowen took, he said sovereignty is, or no, who said it? Yeah, somebody said sovereignty is unstable and unpredictable. I think it was, who said that? Do you remember? I, I think, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it was Taze because it was in the middle of their right. bait, debate of saying, which sovereignty act do you support? Do you support the one yeah. that chases away or do you support the one that gives everyone pipe dreams and doesn't really do anything? And I went, I didn't realize there was two sovereignty acts now. Like yeah, this there's... shows you how much I, out of the loop I was on that part of the debate because I went, wait. Well, I, I just thought that was another one. Like if I was Danielle, I would have said, you may say that the sovereignty act is unstable and unpredictable, but I think that, you know, our prime minister is unstable and unpredictable. So I think that's why the sovereignty act is needed. I, it, it's such an easy platform piece to run on for something like this. Albertans, you know, look at Jason Kenney's, leadership vote albertans want change they want you know a proper leader in alberta that's going to stick up for albertans and make change happen and it's just i'll give her credit it's such an easy thing to run on it really truly is so yeah if you're in the lead and your message is hitting then yeah keep keep hammering away with it yeah did smith do yeah, any so damage to herself chris tonight by not going off script by by not going off script did she just keep her sort of utter in the water and just keep on going straight here until the premier's chair. She, so she damaged herself in regards to the down ballot, down ballot support. Other that, you know, if, if, if you're kind of nervous about the sovereignty act and that's all that she's telling you, this would have been her opportunity in the rebuttals to say, I have a plan for education. I have a plan for healthcare. I have a plan for the arts. I have a plan for everything on the rebuttals. And she didn't do that. She instead pivoted absolutely everything back to Sovereignty Act. And it was to me, now granted, I've, I've been following this Danielle Smith, multiple versions of the Sovereignty Act for a while now, since she came to Calgary, is sort of version one of the Sovereignty Act is, well, all that we're really doing is restating four sections, 92 to 95. Okay, the, okay, hold on two seconds. Hold on two seconds before you continue on. The average yeah. person in Alberta does not give one shit about what section or what number. And at the <laughs> like, literally halfway through the debate, yes. I went to myself and I said, I wonder if she's making this shit up. I wonder if she actually knows what <laughs> section of the Constitution. She probably does. But like, yeah. how do you fact check? Oh, section 121 yeah. and section 93 is this and this and this. Yes. And I'm like, what the like? No, like. I'm a political follower. Chris, you are too. Rob, you are too. Like, are you paying attention to the fact that section 93 is going to be used and going, what the hell does that have to do with anything about getting prices down? Yeah. That Chris? was a 0.1 percenter <laughs> comment. Uh, that one. Yeah. So that's, yeah, but that's a whole debate. That's sort of version one of the sovereignty act. Now the second one is pick anything that we don't like coming out of Justin Trudeau's mouth and we'll just invalidate it. And that's what gets her in trouble from the political scientists of the world and the legal profession and the poly geeks 
and the public policy people, that's where they go, no, you really can't do that. Now, the third option was, and this is what gets to the rurals who say, we're ready to just up and leave Canada, which up rural Alberta is probably approaching 20% that are just that mad. And what gets it over 20% will be this fertilizer thing that that will just absolutely like, I, I pity the agriculture officer that goes into a ditch next time they're around Alberta because pretty soon it'll be like, okay, you know, we'll just, you know, let the cows run you over type of thing. Um, but that's where that's sort of those three versions of the Sovereignty Act. And, and Daniel Smith is vulnerable to saying, okay, Danielle, you've mentioned all three of these. Which one is it? And what do you want your Sovereignty Act to do? And if she says, well, it's just the four sections of the Constitution that nobody gives a shit about, then that turns people off of her. Now they're like, oh, well, wait a minute. But if it's like the full separation or if it's this is going to be the magic pill that's going to make the, the agricultural officers go away and off my ditch, then, OK, sure, boom, go pull Danielle. So I think that's where they were trying to pin her down. She had an opportunity to be uh, down ballot support. Um, what she actually should have gone on, unfortunately, she was dead last in the education debate was. So Brian Jean agrees with Leela here and uh, Rajan Sani on scrapping the curriculum. That's one where I would have, you know, in order for Danielle Smith to, you know, her only room to grow, not her only room, but her biggest room to grow is to go after Brian Jean's supporters and say, no, put me number one. And because of these reasons, because, and what she didn't bring up was Brian Jean's comments about Rachel Notley being brought into cabinet. Like that's a gold mine in rural Alberta. Like that will, you know, if you take a look at, you know, take or uh, Jean support, you know, it goes down right around the time when they start bringing that up. And then all of a sudden he starts bringing up the curriculum, which yeah, there, you know, it, it, if you're going to find somebody who supports the curriculum, they're also going to be a card carrying member of the, uh, of the UCP. Um, and that's what you need to get to win. You don't need to get the teacher vote. And in actual fact, I would add uh, to Rajan's and, you know, and Leela's uh, mistake is in agreeing with teachers, teachers aren't in the UCP. They're over in the NDP camp. So if you're trying to become premier of Alberta through becoming UCP leader, supporting teachers, will not get you a vote. And in fact, it's the alliteration, two-minute Tory teachers from the Redford campaign and from the original um, Ed Stelmack campaign. Now, That's what, you know, it was those two-minute Tory teachers that brought them into yeah. the education fold. Conservatives, remember, they will forgive, you know, Daniel Smith for crossing the floor, but they won't forget those two-minute Tory teachers that came back and brought in Ra Allison Redford and brought in... Uh, Ed Stelmack, both of which they everybody around is going, like, what's going on here in the PC party? Um, you, you bring up so a yeah, let... good, good point here because the, the the talk about our lawyers, our healthcare workers, our teachers came up a few times during the debate about mm -hmm. the attacks on them and it and there was no good answer around how we treat our public unions. And I say that with respect to our public unions, but, mm -hmm. um, okay. We see Doug Ford in Ontario who just won an election with the help of some private unions and some union members. Does this yeah. party not need to switch a switch and say, OK, we saw what Doug Ford did. We need to start extending the olive branch to these unions, because while unions are bad, according to UCP, union mm -hmm. members are workers. Union members are Albertans. So should we not extend an olive branch to these unions as well from a conservative perspective? Or what happens in Alberta does not happen or what happens in Ontario is not what's going to happen in Al Alberta. Rob, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point. I mean, obviously, I look at, you know, I'm more familiar with the municipal politics. But if you look at the municipal election, uh, the unions were a big influence on it. Um, provincially, it, I think it's going to be a very similar story uh, with this next provincial election. And I think there's a perhaps a false assumption that the UCP is anti-union. I don't, I'm sure there are members that, you know, 
of the UCP that are anti-union, but I don't think the party as a whole is anti-union. I think they're more, you know, like I look like I look at an AHS and I, I think they're more, how do I put this correctly? They're not against the workers. They're against, you know, the management and the people above that. The top downs, I, I, right? I truly don't. Yeah, I truly don't think the UCP is anti-union, and I think they need to do a better job of communicating that. Um, you know, I'm not, oh, I don't have a membership, but I am uh, tend to be a conservative supporter, and I, I'm not anti-union. I actually think unions have their place in society, and it's somewhat important because I believe in workers' rights very strongly. I've gone through it myself where, you know, bosses have taken advantage of workers, and it's disgusting, quite frankly. So I... Yeah, I think the the party needs to do a better job of communicating that they're not anti-union. They're, you know, more, they have issue with above the uh, the workers. Yeah. Chris, do you want to jump yeah, in? So then we'll turn to our last uh, subject and then wrap up here. Yeah. So, I mean, I would, I would disagree with Rob on this one. One of the big differences, um, another podcast has a great uh, long form uh, with uh, Monty McNaughton. Um, we do not talk great. about other shows on this show, no, no. <laughs> except the Hurley Burley. The exactly. Hurley Burley's good. I, I like the Hurley Burley, <laughs> yeah. so go for it. <laughs> yeah. So watch with Monty McNaught. So the big difference between Ontario and Alberta is in Ontario, you have very large private sector unions that are very distinct. Uniform private sector union in the auto sector. Lyuna in the construction trades. There's a, there's a few others that are big. Those are the ones that went over and supported Doug Ford in contrast to their traditional NDP and or liberal support. In Alberta, like I mean, I'll give you, so I'm in the construction industry. I know Lyuna in Ontario. I don't know that, uh, that Lyuna exists in, uh, and they do uh, like road paving, road construction, cement, that sort of thing. Uh, that's the construction space that they, that they work in. I don't know if Lyuna, they probably got a shop in, uh, in, uh, in Alberta, it's not very big. So that's the big thing is, and UCP from the policy conventions, uh, not once, but twice, the last two years, uh, the first year they passed a motion uh, that that said, make Alberta a right to work province, you know, which is straight out of the anti-union, like make union membership optional. Um, and then the next year they said, well, we need to change it because nobody knows what the words right to work means so then they said well we're going to re uh we're going to change it to make alberta union membership optional or some sort of plain generic thing both times it was a top five uh debated point on the ucp policy plenary floor so in alberta what what we really have is we have very large public sector unions very vocal public sector unions and our private sector unions are almost non-existent. Uh, you know, you have to go to the UFCW, you know, United Food and Commercial Workers. So where does the UFCW pop up? Well, about every 10 years, uh, Safeway stores are shuttered because there's a union strike there and you have to go somewhere else in order to get your, uh, in order to get your groceries. That's where the Alberta, yeah. you know, the average Albertan will see themselves at UFCW. They don't see Unifor or their predecessor, CAW. They don't see anything. Um, so consequently, the unions just don't have a big, uh, a big impact. Now, where do they do see things? They see it in terms of HSAA. Okay, we're going to strike. The nurses threaten to strike, shut down your health care. Teachers want to walk over a whole host of things. And that is, you know, so a lot of the average Albertan looks at the unions and they go, we're not really too, you know, I can't take my kid to school. I've got to come up with child care. My doctors or my or my healthcare might be impacted negatively. They don't see a positive impact. So hence, yes, the UCP, you know, and Alberta is very anti-union. It could be. We will see, right? Because yeah. who yeah. knows? Who honestly knows? Because I think there are people out there who do think unions are good. I think there's a lot of people out there who support unions. But it, would I have a poll in front of me today to say what of the how much of the population is anti-union compared to com union? I don't. And I think there's not yeah. one out there that could prove me wrong. But I want to turn to the last subject because we're about 10 minutes away from the top of the hour. And I just want to get this in here first. So this is going to be a roundtable. And this is going to be not a quick fire 
there, but I, I, I'm going to ask two different questions, but I'm going to ask them separately. And I'm going to first start with this question. We're going to all answer. I'm going to answer as well. I want to know from you, who was the loser of this debate tonight? Who lost this debate? Who did themselves uh, not any good by going to this debate and opening their mouth? Uh, and Chris, Rob, who wants to take this one first? Because whoever starts with this one, the next one is going to be who won the debate. So don't answer that one yet. But who lost the debate? Rob, Chris, who wants to take this one? Oh, okay, Chris, I'll go. Chris, go for it. I who, think, who lost the debate? I think the, I think the loser of the debate was Danielle Smith. Because it said she beat everybody up, or, or, or she constantly mentioned the Sovereignty Act, which will be, you know, the question, you know, if you're pro-Sovereignty Act, you're going to vote Danielle number one. If you're anti-Sovereignty Act, you're going to vote anybody but Danielle, and you're going to vote her number six. Uh, she had the opportunity to, debate, to say, I'm more than that, and she didn't do it. Uh, she tried to do it at the very end. I think it was her who said, I'm here for the little guy and the NDP is not. And that was essentially too little to debate, too little too late, especially seeing that it was so sleepy that I bet you most people, you know, look at the viewership. Down it goes by about question five or six. Most people probably turned off. Uh, so she was definitely, in my opinion, the loser of the debate. Rob, what about yourself? And then I'll answer. I it sounds like a cheap cop out, but I would have to agree. I mean, I I think this was Danielle's chance to you know hit a home run, slam it out of the park, and make herself that first ballot choice. And I don't think that she brought anything new to the table. Now, the, on the other side of that, as I said, she's the perceived front runner, so it's a fine balancing act. What you're doing is working. So, do you really want to take that big swing and hope that you hit it? I, it's tough to say. That being said, she didn't she didn't advance herself in any way, I don't think. So it's it's a risk reward, and I, I feel she took the safe path and we'll see if it pays off. Thank you, Rob. Um for me, and this is something I mentioned to Chris at the top of the show before we got on here. My lose the loser of the debate the debate tonight for me was Jeff Davison. I'm sorry. Yeah, I would agree. Date, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I hit this hard in the last debate. When the debate is about the moderator, the debate is a lost cause. And him inter... Oh, yeah, go, oh, we'll go to you after in a few seconds here. I just want... Can I change my answer now yeah. that you said that? <laughs> exactly. I didn't know we could pick the moderator. <laughs> oh, I'm picking the moderator on this one. But I'm sorry. Debates, people clap. You understand that. Yeah. You are you're you're not streaming this on CTV or CBC or Global where you have to fit it in for two hours. This is live stream via the internet. You get to go as long as you want because that's what happens on the internet. If you go 45 minutes, you go 45 minutes. If you go three hours, whatever, you allow for clapping and you allow for interaction because okay. Don't yell at the, the people on the, the stage, but if clapping is the worst thing that's going on, then allow it. And that's just my own personal opinion. So the tonight loser of the debate was Jeff Davison. And, and uh, he's, he's a nice guy. He's been on the show before. Yeah. But when you I moderated a few debates all online, you let it go for as long as you can. Because sometimes when you have the internet, you can go as long as you can. <laughs> There's my well, loser. That, you're Go ahead. Bob. You're so right, Chris. I mean, we talked about how the debate was boring and to just, you know, silence crowd interaction. Can you imagine watching a hockey game? Where, well, we did where there was no crowd. It was pretty boring. So, yeah. I mean, well, imagine yeah, the weird. ref during the like Stanley Cups going, OK, guys, we're in golf time now. So everyone has to shut up and let the yeah. <laughs> the sport, the athletes do what they need to do. Uh, it just I'll be honest. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, I was listening to the audio in my ear while I was golfing tonight, and I, I bet you my the guys I was playing with got so sick of me saying, oh, God, Jeff, leave it alone. I said that. I must have said it a dozen times. Like, just let it happen. Exactly. Um, uh, Chris, do you have anything to add to that before we go on to the winner of the debate? Um, no? Okay. No, let's go on to the winners. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> let's go on to the winners here. So, Rob, I'm putting you in the hot seat so we don't get the same answer this as we did last time with uh, Chris. So who was the winner of the debate for you, Rob? 
You know what? I, I, I don't think anybody else is going to say the same thing as me on this one. I thought Rebecca Schulz was quite solid. Uh, I, I think she's a good candidate, and I just don't think people know what she's about. And I, I thought she did a fairly solid job of identifying herself and, you know, showing how she's different, what her ideas are, and kind of legitimizing who she is and what she's about. I, I'll be honest, if I had a membership, I'd probably put her near the top of my ballot after that. I, yeah, she, I th she think she just made a good impression and legitimized herself quite well. Chris, what about yourself? Who won the debate in your opinion? So for me, yeah. So thank, thanks, Rob, for taking my thunder on this one. So uh, Darn you know, it. In, full <laughs> in, in full disclosure, Chris uh, Brown, you, you know, you, you and I, we met at a couple of Rebecca Schultz uh, rallies and whatnot. So I am sort of supporting her and uh, being on her uh, little volunteer team as she goes through uh, goes through Calgary. But uh, so I would give my actually, I would give my runner up to Todd Lowen. He cracked the best joke of the whole oh, time yeah. uh, with his comment about, you know, the BS coming out of Trudeau could fertilize the entire province. Like that, that, was, that was probably the standout. Now, it was a little bit Ross Perot-ish of, who's this guy? Oh, okay. Oh, oh yeah, Todd, you're still here. Um, and, but definitely for me, the winner of the debate was Rebecca Schultz. Uh, both for, you know, straight from her, straight from her introduction, she had about the boldest, most unique introduction about saying, I'm not ready to say goodbye to the Calgary MLAs. And that, that is one of the big questions as we go into the final stretches here. I don't think Calgary isn't supporting Danielle Smith. I think they're fearful of Danielle Smith. If there's going to be an anti-Danielle uh, faction, it will be led by Calgary. Um, so definitely looking at that. She also mentioned, she says, I'm not ready to write off Edmonton. Now, Edmonton, yes, they're way down in membership sales. But, you know, those members that have left feel like the UCP has abandoned them. Um, a lot of people won't, you know, a lot of conservatives in Edmonton won't get memberships because they feel the UCP has abandoned them in favor of rural and MLAs. So really great that. Um, and then, you know, the second thing is uh, she had a really great close. Yeah. She recapped. She also got, and this was another thing, go back and take a look. At least three other candidates mentioned her campaign slogan of get Alberta back on track. So there's that. And then as well, too, finally, and I'm looking at my notes and saying she was the one that used her notes the least. Most yeah. of the candidates actually reviewed like they were reading a script. Yeah, that's true. Looking down at their notes for both their introduction and their closing. Now, that's free form. So, OK, sure. You need to take your notes to look at, you know, in order to get some certain fact based approach or, you know, what's my talking point? But the intro is yours. So you should be, you know, you should definitely not be on your intro and close saying, you know, talk directly into the camera. And she did that the least. And so for that reason, and for all the reasons that Rob mentioned, I think she won the debate. But I also don't think it's going to really change anybody's opinion because it's all locked in. Now I, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a little bit of a curveball at you guys because I think the winner of the debate was Danielle Smith tonight. By not losing fully, by not having a punch land it on her correctly, smack dab, she won the debate tonight. Um, while you cannot talk to the front runner of the UCP leadership race by not asking her questions directly or having that open three minute conversation. By her presence on that stage, even though those 45 seconds were buttles that she got, she was able to do what she does best. And Rob said it so eloquently at the beginning of the show. She knows how to talk. She knows how to relay a message in a quick 45 second soundbite that at the end of the day, tomorrow morning at the water cooler, someone will be talking about it of, oh, did you hear about this sovereignty act? Or did you hear about this or did you hear about that? And at the end of the day, by her being on that stage and not being having a knockout punch by one of the other candidates, she won the debate. And I and I mean that with respect because I think that a lot of the other candidates had some good uh, nights as well. But without 
without actually losing the debate, she won. And even with all the other candidates not talking to her or bypassing her for all the other second tier candidates, she's she's on her way to the premier's chair if nothing else happens or if she doesn't go on another show and say something stupid. So that is who I believe won the debate tonight. That's just me. That's a good point. <laughs> and yeah, if she doesn't host any more talk shows, she may be very well on her way. Yeah. Um, so I, I know I said we'd be an hour. We're at the hour mark. Oh, Chris, Rob, I want to thank you both so much for sitting down with me for the last hour. Uh, I know we've covered a lot. We probably could go on for another hour. And I know I just said, Jeff Davison, you can let people talk if you're on the internet. But on this show, we try to cut it off at an hour mark. You hypocrite. Yeah, I know. Ah! Uh, Chris, Rob, thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you both on the show for the first time. And I promise it will not be the last time to have you both on the show awesome yes thanks thanks everybody thanks viewers and, yes uh, uh, thanks for putting up with uh, the three of us for uh, the last hour on uh podcast tv where we do have a choice as woo! to uh what portion of youtube you are uh you're gonna click and uh please do click subscribe and uh like the uh, chris brown interviews podcast i think that's your portion yeah uh, you're, you're like chris and you got you got the name of the show wrong like i invite you onto my oh. show and you get the name <laughs> of the show wrong uh but truly uh for those who are watching still and who, who are going to watch this later on hit the subscribe button on youtube follow us on apple podcast spotify or wherever you get your favorite podcast because it does help with us grow and you know that damn freaking algorithm that people try <laughs> to talk about and the gatekeepers you got to go in and hit the subscribe button so that way we continue to grow the show because we are growing the show and we got some great things in store for the future so with that i have yourself an excellent night and remember everyone get up from behind social media for at least five minutes a day go have a conversation with somebody because it helps our society helps our democracy and helps us be a better people at the end of the day with that have yourself an excellent day and remember keep talking <laughs>